Welcome aboard, Giants fans, to episode 71 of Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giglio, joined by James Cratch and Dan Duggan. They cover the Giants for NJ Advance Media. Just got back recently to the United States after a trip to London. The Giants go out there and win a game against the Rams. A lot of other stuff, of course, going on with the New York Giants. Stuff bigger than the game. They're on a bye this week, so we will talk about the team and the team at the bye, the win, and everything that went into what happened here over the last week with Josh Brown. First, though, welcome back, guys. James, we'll start with you. How was the trip and, uh, and, and London? It was, it was a good trip. Uh, you know, you have to be very careful walking the streets of London or else you're going to get hit by a car. It's a little disorienting. The, uh, the fact they drive on the wrong side of the road, or I guess they would say we drive on the wrong side of the road. Uh, it's a really cool city. I, I was di- a lot di- more different than I thought it would be. I kind of figured it would be similar to New York, but for the most part, it just seems it's just a bunch of little residential areas. Things close pretty early at night, even on the weekend. So uh, it was definitely a foreign country. Let me put it that way. But it was very kind of interesting road trip, and you, know, you saw a lot of cool stuff. Dan, how about you? What'd you think? And there was the story you guys put up right when you guys got there, I believe, how you almost missed the flight out, so you had an adventure from the start, right? Yeah, that was, that was an exciting start to the trip. Uh, yeah, I had to sprint through uh, Newark Airport to, to catch for the flight, so that was always, that's always a good way to start things. But yeah, no, it, was, it was a fun trip. You know, Obviously, tried to mix in as much sightseeing, sightseeing as we could, but uh, obviously it was a business trip, and uh, so we, we had a little fun, had a lot of work, and uh, you know, I brought a little cold back. Uh, from across the pond, so the bye week is coming at the right time for me. I know, uh, I know the players feel that way, but uh, I got the uh, I'm a little beat up myself, so I'll try to make it through the podcast say without sounding too bad. I think you'll be all right. We'll be all right. We'll get through this one as the Giants win the bye. We'll get to the team, the state of the team at the bye, a little bit on the win against the Rams and the big game by Atlantic Collins. But we have to start our conversation today, guys, with the news that came down. We're doing this podcast on a Wednesday morning. Yesterday afternoon, the Giants officially released Josh Brown, the saga that's been going on. For just about a week now, but you know it's gone on way longer than that. When you really think about it, I mean, they re-signed Josh Brown in April. In August, everything starts coming out. I mean, the NFL announces that Brown was suspended one game for unspecified violation league conduct policy. We, NJ Advance Media, you guys report later that Brown was arrested in May of 2015 in Washington State on a fourth-degree domestic violence charge, and then the Giants and Brown start telling their tale of everything and what they thought happened and what the Giants believed. Uh, In late August, the 18th, Brown said it was just a moment. Uh, You had Ben McAdoo kind of retracting or going back on his zero tolerance type of policy that he talked about in January when he first took the job. Uh, And John Mara in late August said he was comfortable with the Giants and the information that they had at the time to make their decision. Now, as we know, things changed. You guys reported last week. Uh, It started October 19th all the way to Tuesday's release. Everything changed. New police documents emerged showing the written admissions of the pattern of physical abuse. The Giants announced a day later that Brown would not travel with the team. The NFL puts him on the exempt list. He doesn't go to the game. The Giants come home Tuesday afternoon. He is released after what was, and I'm sure you guys felt it across the Atlantic Ocean, but here... Uh, I mean, there's a weekend of backlash against the Giants for their ignorance or their role or whatever words we want to use or you guys want to use to describe how they handled this. But eventually, after all that, they do release him. James, you go first. I mean, you you guys have been at the center of reporting on this. Your thoughts on, on what unfolded over the last week with Josh Brown? Okay, so just so – because I've had a couple of readers, you know, fans ask, why did this all happen on Wednesday night? I guess a week from – when we're tape a week back from when we're taping this podcast. So when when we we first reported the story in August, and then obviously our outlet and other outlets contacted the King County Sheriff Department, which is in Washington State, to get the full police report. Um, we had an initial police report, and there was a full police report. So what happened at that point is the way it works in, in this particular uh, jurisdiction, this particular sheriff department, is that. We when you when a when a reporter files a request for open records, they they, re, they try to be as specific as possible, and and also as broad as possible to cast the, the widest net, but then also to ensure that the request is fulfilled and it, they get what they're looking for. So, basically, what's happened at this point is every document that pertains to this initial May fifteen uh, May twenty two twenty fifteen arrest has been periodically sent to 
reporters, in, including NJ Advanced Media, including us, as they have, you know, basically the clerk there and, and the, the police and the detective's office have kind of signed off on things to be released. So I believe, you know, what, I can't remember the exact dates, but at some point earlier in the fall, maybe end of August, uh, I think maybe mid-September, there was an email sent out to us and I assume every other reporter that uh, has, a, you know, requested these documents that said that the investigation would be closed at some point in the future and that they anticipated having the final release of documents. Uh, that final FOIA would be sent out on or before December 31st of this year. But it, it wasn't really clear about when it would happen. It just, that was the deadline. They, they said it would definitely be released on or before that date. So then fast forward to, to Wednesday, and that just happened to be the day that the, the sheriff's department signed off on everything. I guess the prosecutor officially declined to press the charges against Brown, and the documents were sent. And from that point, you know, it was just kind of a race who, who reported them first and what details got up there. So that's why I think, you know, obviously we had the post up first on Wednesday night. But then you saw several other outlets follow quick, soon after with, with the same information. So basically, that's why this all happened. In the fact that, for whatever reason, you know they they crossed their eyes and dotted their t's in Washington State, and they got it out on Wednesday night, Wednesday afternoon for them. That's when we received it, and it just happened to be this timing of the Giants are about to get on a plane to London in 24 hours, and this all comes out. But that's basically what happened. You know. We knew that there was going to be a final release of documents. We just didn't know what was in these documents that we were going to get. And when we got them, it turned out to be 155 pages of rather damning information that has kind of precipitated what we've had over the last week. Oh, it certainly has. And it's changed the conversation about the Giants, the NFL, Josh Brown. And then from there, from those documents on Wednesday, your post right before you guys flew out, uh, then the conversation started to be, well, what happened here? And why, what are the Giants doing? Dan, were you surprised with how the Giants handled this before the release of Josh Brown on Tuesday? So, you know, Thursday, not taking him, the exempt list, and waiting till they got back to make their decision. Did it surprise you that it didn't happen sooner? Or did you think the timeline, considering the events of Wednesday night, kind of made sense to when they would get him off the team? I mean, I've been surprised how they've handled this from Jump Street. I mean, I wouldn't even say this past week has been kind of the biggest mismanagement of it. Obviously, uh, I don't think they've handled even this great. Uh, you know, in, in this day and age, you kind of have to act fast. I know you have to have all the information, uh, but you can't really just kick the can down the road a few days and, and hope things blow over because all that's going to do is make the uh, kind of the fervor uh, intensify. That, that's obviously what happened to them a couple of times during this whole ordeal. Um, it felt like to me... Going back to last week, I mean, their hands were tied a little bit. That London trip made things a lot dicier. You, you know, you couldn't put that guy on a plane, but they didn't have enough information at that point probably to, to kind of cut the cord. But it felt like they were just waiting for the commissioner's office to step in and put them on the exempt list to buy them a little time. I mean, even just from a pragmatic football sense, they didn't have to cut a guy that way uh, in order to sign Robbie Gold. Uh, but then I don't understand why it took even into Tuesday to, to make the final decision. I mean, what, what more information did they need? Uh, you know, it just seemed like they were just a little slow on the draw and everything here. And these types of things, I think one of the most important things you can do is, is act decisively. Like, listen, you're going to make mistakes. And, you know, John Mara, you know, kind of finally owned up to that in a statement yesterday. But there was plenty of other times before yesterday where they could have, you know, stepped up and, and rectified this situation. I mean, you go back just the fact that I can never get past um, the fact that this is a 37-year-old kicker. You knew – had all this baggage, whether you knew all the specifics that eventually came out, uh, why would you even bring him back on a, on a two-year contract? I mean, this isn't uh, some stud young player who's you know, going to be a cornerstone in your franchise that you say, well, you know, let's go like Lawrence Taylor, that type of guy. Like, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with some of his off-field things and you know, hopefully uh, get him fixed up. But a guy like Josh Brown, they could have just washed the hands of this uh, in the winter. None of this ever would have blown up in their face. And it's just you you look at that uh, just from a business decision. It doesn't really make any sense, uh, especially knowing everything we know now. No, it doesn't. And it makes the Giants look really bad here. And, and James, I know you guys have written about this a lot. And Steve Politi, our columnist, has written about this on, at, at NJ Advanced Media, NJ.com. I mean, the Giants have had a reputation for years of being a classy organization, a, a, an ownership that has been around at least the Mara family for decades and decades. It's the beginning of the NFL. And, you know, this is going to be tough to get past. And I think for a lot of people, like the Giants, 
are not different than anybody else. They made a mistake, and they, uh, you know, they were part of something that the NFL's tried to distance itself from. But they are now in the center of all this. That you know, they had someone on their team that really probably shouldn't have been there for a while, and and they just dragged their feet in this whole thing. Definitely. I mean, look, I think it's fair to say the Giants and the Mara family they consider that franchise to be a public trust, and at this point, there are still so many questions that they have yet to answer, and they have to answer, in my opinion. Look, Josh Brown is gone. That part of it's over. But, you know, as Dan said, my, what I come back to is a couple of things. One, in hindsight, Josh Brown clearly was being misleading at best and flat-out lying at worst when he said the day after you know, the suspension was announced and that we reported the arrest that it was just a moment, okay? It clearly was just not a moment. All right. I mean, this is way down the totem pole, but he told he told reporters that his divorce was finalized and it's still not finalized. Now, that might be semantics and that might just be a, a case of, you know, legal processes taking too long and, you know, red tape and everything. But he's still not divorced from his wife. So that's another thing that he said that was not true. You know, when he returned at, after the suspension, I believe, you know, the I think Deadspin had reported that, you know, well, it, let me go back. The, the, the written admissions that are in these latest police documents, the, the contract w- with the, uh, the therapist, the letter to the friends and, and family and, I guess, uh, you know, business partners. I'm not sure exactly who all got that letter. That letter was mentioned initially in the, uh, the first batch of police records with the, uh, the interview that Brown's wife did with police several days after his arrest in May of 2015. The Deadspin had also reported that there was, I'm not sure if it was this letter or a different letter, where he admitted to all these things. Now, he was asked about that letter at his locker after the Saints game, and he said he didn't know what it was. So that's not true, because clearly these letters are here. They're in a police document. So, And my question is, to start off, how do the Giants, if they know, and, and you know, we have to, you know, John Mayer, I think, has to clarify what he said to Mike Francesa on the radio, where Josh Brown had admitted to the team that he'd abused his wife. Now, what you know, and people are are killing Mara for saying you know it's, the extent is not clear. And look, I, I thought Mara's comments were tone deaf to Francesa, and you know, obviously, I think he tried to to repair that a little bit with his statement on Tuesday. But okay, so what did the Giants know? What aspects of abuse did, they, did Josh Brown tell them? And then, you know, what I'm wondering is, was, was everything that came out in these documents last week, was that a total stun to the Giants? Because if the Giants knew that there were multiple instances of issues, abuse, whatever they are, then for Brown to go up there and say it was just a moment, they had to know that wasn't true. And if they knew that wasn't true, then why was that acceptable for the Giants to leave that hanging out there? You know, that, that's one of many questions. I'm sure we can come up with tons of them, but that to me is, did they not know if they didn't know, then they, this investigation or whatever the heck it was didn't work. And if they did know, then why are they why are they cutting him now? Is it just because there's public pressure, more public pressure? And and two, if they did know, then why did they let him get up there and say, uh, you know, hey, it was just a moment. I don't know what this letter is. If he had told them there was a letter, you know. And another thing is, how can the Giants have have gone forward? not knowing for sure that this letter didn't exist. Clearly it did. It just took two months to get out there. Yeah, it's bad either way. It really is. I mean, the Giants look awful here. And uh, one more, just kind of a a moving forward, because I know our listeners do want to hear about the team and the team at the bye and and have had a lot of Josh Brown um, information and stories at them for a long time now. So we'll get to the football in just a second. But I just want from each of you, I mean, off of what James, what you just said there, I mean, I remember during Bounty Gate, it, Roger Goodell said ignorance is not an excuse. And that feels like what we're, we're – this whole thing, you know, maybe that could be an excuse here for the Giants if they wanted to be. But again, it's not. So now what in, in terms of the Giants and, one, how they're perceived and will there be any sort of punishment here or is this just over? Does everyone kind of just wash their hands and, and hope Josh Brown just disappears? You know, Dan, what do you think for the rest of this year and – and moving forward, this story, I mean, Josh Brown's no longer part of the Giants, but do you think this is over? I mean, I would never say never with this because it's, it seemed like, you know, obviously things had died down. And as, as James said, you know, reporters kind of knew another shoe was about to drop, but I, you never really know. I mean, even Josh Brown's statement, he's talking about he wants to be out in the public eye. I think he'd probably be better served to, to kind of lay low for a little bit and, and let things blow over. Uh, as far as for the Giants, I mean, obviously, I think the sort of public viewing of the franchise is – 
it's going to take some time to repair. And for some people, I don't think they'll be able to. And you just got to be able to deal with that. I can't really see uh, any repercussions come from the NFL, though, because, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, they've handled everything by the book. The NFL certainly didn't come out looking any better than the Giants in this. I mean, you know, they, they've had the whole strong stance about domestic violence. And then all of a sudden a guy gets a domestic violence charge and you give him a one game suspension when the baseline is supposed to be six. I mean, that's that to me goes right up there with why do the Giants bring him back is why did the NFL not just give him six games? If they had just given him a six game suspension, I think a lot of this could have been avoided because that would have been a severe penalty. And it would have almost been, you know, you kind of did the crime, you did the time. But the fact that he got such a slap on the wrist, I think that you know made this whole situation much more difficult. Uh, than it needed to be. Um, so, I mean, the NFL basically threw their hands up and said, oh, you know, we couldn't get the information. And then, of course, the uh, sheriff's department, uh, you know, ripped the NFL investigators for, you know, being goofus, which is one of the you know, great words that come out of this whole, uh, this whole saga. But, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody comes out looking good. I, I don't think the Giants are, you know, in any more hot water. Uh, you know, they're, they're at the peak of it right now, and I think it will blow over. I think, as you said, you know, fans are going to want to go back to football. That's just the nature of the beast. But, uh, there definitely is some some kind of long term damage to the brand and, and to the reputation. Last thoughts from you, James, on on this whole situation that that's really been uh, you know unfortunately for the Giants and unfortunately for everyone involved that's a victim here. A big story of the Giants season so far. Where do we go from here? That's a great question. I think in terms of you know could the NFL punish them? You know obviously there's the part of the personal conduct policy that states that you know teams and players can be can be penalized for withholding information from the league. I think. It's way, It's very premature. I, I don't know. I don't even think people should talk about that because, as of now, there, there's no inclination or any indication at all that people didn't give the NFL information. I think that Dan's right. I think at the end of the day, the NFL, where they made their biggest mistake, in my opinion, was they should have just given him a six-game suspension, no matter who wouldn't cooperate or, or what documents they couldn't obtain, and basically just said, "Our baseline is six games. We're suspending you for six games." If the union wants to appeal and take this to court and take it to an arbitrator and it gets knocked down or it gets reduced, that's fine. The league did what they could do. They hit a six-game suspension. I think that's, in hindsight, will be the biggest error the NFL made. On the Giants' side, Dan's right. The story eventually will go away because most, you know, unfortunately, most fans just want to get back. You know, they're just going to want to get back to football, and a lot of people aren't going to care about this. But I do think that the Giants, it's not going to go away until the Giants come out, John Mara, Jerry Reese, and say. This is what we knew. This is what we didn't know. This is why we decided to do this. This is where we went right. This is where we went wrong. This is what happened. Because when the Giants first, when John Mara first spoke, his, the basic underlying notion of what they were saying was there's mitigating circumstances that we don't want to make public that, have, that we have, to our knowledge, that has allowed us to form our decision, our opinion. Well, now that doesn't really fly anymore because he's not here anymore. They went from standing by Josh and saying, you know, they're basically saying, trust us, we have our reasons, to Josh Brown has been released, we hope he does well. And the way that statement read, it doesn't sound like the Giants are going to be actively working with Josh Brown anymore. It sounds like Josh Brown is completely and totally separate from the Giants organization. It's not like they released him, but they're going to work with him on the side. So I think now the Giants, the Giants can't really pull the, you know, trust us anymore card. They need to come out and they need to be up front with the public about what they knew. And I feel that if they, this story is not just going to blow away because it's a bye week and we're going to get back on Monday. And I mean, there's still going to be questions and I feel the giants, they owe it to their fans and they owe it to the public and they owe it to the league, in my opinion, to come out and say, this is what happened. This is what went wrong. This is what we have to do better at next time. And if they do that, I think that that's going to be the, big first step forward for this franchise kind of getting back on its feet and restoring a little bit of its reputation. Will they do that? I don't know, but I think they should do that. And yeah, the story probably will go away if they don't do that, but they're not going to be able to start rebuilding some of this damage until they do that. Well put. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and this, there's probably more layers to this that will come out uh, eventually. And hopefully the Giants do answer those questions from you guys and everybody else that has them for this organization on the field, as it's weird to transition off of you know, topics like that to the football team and what they did over the weekend and what they will have in front of them the rest of the way. Guys, four and three through seven games. The point differential is minus eight. They won two. They lost three. They won two. Some good, some bad. Last place in the NFC East, but that's just probably more because the division is is very balanced and, and doesn't have a bad team. 
what are the Giants? Dan, we'll start with you. At the bye, as we look ahead, what do you think this team is right now? Uh, it kind of goes back to, I think, what I said last week. They're a mediocre team, and, and I think, really, they're fortunate to be 4-3, and three, but you can also look at that uh, you know, glass half full or glass half empty because they're 4-3 and three without really playing very well. So, I mean, hey, I think most teams in the league would sign up for a winning record, especially when you're not playing your best because you could easily be 2-5 and five if you, you know, some of these games gone, went the other way. And uh, I think you just look at where they're at, though. They need to play better. Some of these stats that have kind of been accumulated in the first half of the season – you know, they're defying the football gods to continue winning games with, you know, the, the offensive numbers they're putting up, the turnover differential, the time of possession, the running stats. There's so many of these numbers suggest that this is, should be a losing team. And again, hey, they're, they're at the midpoint basically at four and three. So uh, I think you just kind of take a deep breath and, you know, say, whew, we, uh, we survived a, a rough stretch with a, with a good record and, and kind of stayed in the race. But I think you, just, you look ahead, it's not sustainable. So uh, either they're going to continue to play like this, and you know, like I said, the football gods will even things out, and I don't think they'll go you know, with a winning record down the stretch, or things will maybe start to click. I mean, I think this is a huge week for the coaching staff to address some of the problems, come back with I – mean, they need to make some serious changes, especially offensively. Uh, but if they're able to do that, I mean, again, you still look at the team. The pieces seem to be in place for uh, you know, a much better product than what they've put out there offensively. Uh, I think the defense has been pretty good, so – uh, again, if you want to look at half full, they're four and three. They'll play their best football. So uh, maybe things take off in the second half. James, when when the coaches sit down, like Dan was just saying, do you think in the back of their heads they'll say, "Look, the NFC is really wide open this year. Not just the top, but even you know the wild card races. I mean, the teams that we thought would be dominant, maybe not quite as. I, I think the NFC is ripe for almost anyone that's you know around five hundred to make a run and." and do something in the second half? Or do you think they'll look at the other way, like, we, we have some issues here we have to clean up? How do you think the Giants should look at themselves right now? I think they should look at themselves as a team. As Dan said, they're, a, they're kind of the soft middle of the NFL. It's just They, they could finish 6-10. and 10, They could finish 10-6. and six. I think it's just going to come down to, look, the schedule is favorable for them, especially coming off of this bye week. Eagles at home, uh, Bengals at home on Monday Night Football, the Bears, who, yes, I picked them to go to the playoffs, but they are a complete dumpster fire after that. Then they go to Cleveland and play, play the Browns. So the next four games set up very nicely for them to get well and to put themselves in a position to make a major push down the stretch. Will they do that? I don't know. But I think Dan is right. They're a mediocre football team. They're 4-3. and three. They haven't played very well. They could be 5-2. and two. They could be 2-5. and five. Now it's just going to become a matter of, do they come? See, I think the Giants have to look at this this way. Their defense has been everything they could have expected from that defense. You know, yes, the third down defense has been poor, and there hasn't been as much of a pass rush or sacks as they had like. But that defense has won the last two games for them. That was something they never had a prayer to say last year. So they look at it from that glass half full perspective of our defense is playing really well, and we can fix this offensive malaise. Then I think they should go in this bye week thinking we're ready to make a run and get back to the playoffs and contend for the NFCs. But if they can't fix that offense and the defense starts to regress a little bit, which it could because it's not a group that's getting very many takeaways, and usually you need takeaways to be successful, then they could be looking at a sense where this could all kind of tailspin again, just like it did last year coming out of the bye. Yeah, I mean, the, you said mentioned the schedule there, James. I'm looking at it right now. They really have to play well in these next four because then – the back end of that schedule, December all the way through the last game on January 1st, that's not easy. They'll, it goes at Pittsburgh, home for Dallas and Detroit, at Philadelphia on a Thursday night, at Washington to end the season. So, yeah, if we're talking, you know, if we're talking in December about a playoff push, they, they really had to play well and take care of business with the three home games, like you mentioned, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, Chicago, and then at Cleveland to finish out uh, November. So November is going to be a big month. And, Dan, when you look at this team – James was just talking about the defense and how well it's played. The offense, you mentioned, has not played uh, up to its standards. What's the Giants' identity? It, has it become their defense after being an awful defense last year? Is that the identity of the Giants now, or do they not have one? Uh, well, I think it's kind of by default, Bennett. I think uh, everyone came into the season expecting kind of a high, high-powered, high high-octane offense to be the identity. And you know, Ben McAdoo loves to use the phrase about like heavy-handed and this physical football team. And I mean, I don't. We haven't seen that. I mean, you're averaging two yards of carry basically the last couple of weeks. Certainly, uh, they're not living up to the the identity he wants the team to have. Uh, you can say they have a little bit defensively. Uh, the run defense has been pretty solid. 
you know, I think the defense, we've talked about this a few times during the season, they've just done a really good job of keeping this team in games because, you know, you might look at the stats and they're not a top 10 defense, but they're putting a lot of bad spots based on the turnovers, based on the fact that the offense is going three and out so frequently. So I think if you, you know, it's one of those deals where you have to maybe watch the games more and just look at the stats to, to judge things. I think the defense has been solid. And uh, yeah, I think what you still think this identity can be, you know, is again a high powered offense because of the weapons they have. Uh, I, th- I think that, you know, this week is just again a huge week for McAdoo to to kind of get in the in the lab and figure out some some new things. I mean, that's the biggest thing to me that's been really stunning is how vanilla and predictable this offense has been. I mean, when you have three weapons like Cruz and Shepard and obviously Beckham, that should give you a ton of options, ways to get creative. They're all very interchangeable pieces. Uh, move them around. You know, bunch them in trip sets. Do all sorts of different things. And instead, they just come out and you know basically the same alignment down after down uh obviously they haven't been able to run the ball it's just it's really surprising to me that the offense has just been kind of so stagnant and, and I think that this is a huge time for them you know you have time to uh you know really sit down and examine things and then come out with maybe a new plan next week maybe you come out and you start running a lot of four wide sets throw out a five wide set then go the other way throw in some two tight end site, sets and try and get uh the run game going I just think that there needs to be more variety it's you know it goes back to the old Einstein quote if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, I mean, you know, it's you expect different results. So uh, I think it's just time to to mix things up and kind of stop banging your head against the wall, thinking that oh, eventually, uh, you know, this will work. It's been seven games, and, and clearly it hasn't. James, how would you grade McAdoo? Ben McAdoo through his first seven games. Let's keep this to the football. Obviously, uh, opinions have varied on on what he said and the Josh Brown situation, which we covered a lot earlier in this episode. Just on the field, from a, uh, a head coach's perspective. First year as a head coach, an offensive guy, but the offense is not doing well. And earlier this week in the conference call, he, he said he'd evaluate himself and would even look at the play calling duties and, and how he's run that. What do you think about McAdoo so far through seven games? It's tough. I, I think, obviously, the offense has been inept, and you have to blame Ben for that. And I, I don't look, I don't think Ben's going to give up the play calling duties. We, we went to at this point when they lost to the Packers and he, he said the same thing. And then he basically went on Francesa a couple days later and said that, you know, he feels that calling the plays is important to him and helps him coach the team. And you know what? He's right. Because the bottom line is this. The Giants hired Ben McAdoo because he had two really good offenses and Eli Manning kind of had a career renaissance. If they had wanted a, a CEO coach that was just going to oversee everything, then they should have just hired Mike Smith, who was the runner-up. So they hired Ben McAdoo because, he's off, but because of his work with the offense and be, partly because he was a play caller. So they, he should call the plays for the rest of the year at least. I, I think it's way too early to say. And I don't necessarily think that McAdoo's play calling is the re, or his game preparation is the reason why this Giants offense isn't playing well. I think the Giants offense isn't playing well because – Eli Manning isn't playing well. Beckham had his issues early on in the year. I think the offensive line needs, I mean, it's not a great offensive line, but they're kind of getting, I mean, they can't run the ball, in my opinion, more because they have no tight end that can block and they have no fullback that can block rather than the offensive line doesn't block. The offensive line isn't a great line by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think they're the major issue with that run game issue, which has to be fixed. They have to get the run game going because it's pathetic right now. And yes, they've had some injuries, but you have to knock Ben for what's happened with the offense because he's the guy. That's his baby. But at the same time, this team has been very resilient. They're four and three when they easily could have a worse record. They have won ugly. They've kept themselves in the hunt. And for that, I mean, I get the feeling that the players, they love McAdoo and they really feed off him. So I guess... B minus for Ben. I think the offense is a is a major knock against them, and it's a concern, and it's something that really is you know an issue. I mean, if it was just a couple of games, you could say okay, it's just a funk, but it, it's a long term issue now. We're at mid season, and the offense still hasn't gotten going. That's a big problem. But again, they're four and three. Uh, I know you said don't count the stuff off the field, but they've weathered a lot of storms. It's not just Josh Brown. I mean, it's it's the whole Odell stuff. It's the fact that his left tackle decided to go assault a reporter in the locker room. It's everything. So I'd give Ben about a B minus right now. I think that all things considered, he's done a pretty solid job of keeping this team afloat at midseason because there's a lot of things that could have sunk them by now. Yeah, that's true. There, there could have been. The Giants could be under 500 and really looking way up at the standings. Instead, they're right in the middle of this thing with a lot of season to go. All right, so nine games to go 
Dan, if, if we're having a conversation, let's say uh, in early December, leading into Dallas week on the 11th of December, if we're having a conversation about the Giants still right in the thick of things after the next five games here, who has to step up? Give me a couple players, each of you could do this, couple players that have to play better after the bye than they did before if the Giants are going to be a team that you know is in playoff contention the whole way. Uh, all right, offensively, I'll say just kind of wh- whatever running back wants to step up. I mean, whether it's Rashad Jennings, uh, who to me really hasn't been very impressive. I know we missed some time with the injury, but uh, just really doesn't hasn't shown any burst. And I think uh, with this offensive line, if you're only going to get what's blocked, you're, you're not going to have a very productive running game. You need a guy who uh, can make some people miss, can break some tackles, and I think everyone kind of wants to see rookie Paul Perkins get that shot. I mean, he's shown glimpses. Who knows if he's you know, up to being kind of a workhorse back, but I think that's the guy uh, I would zero in on who I want to see get more carries uh, in the second half. So I'll say maybe Perkins uh, offensively. Uh, defensively, I'll go with the defensive ends. I think the secondary has been really solid when healthy uh, this season. I think even the linebackers, especially Keenan Robinson and uh, Casillas, have probably been a little better than expected. And I think you just saw the defensive ends, what they can do to a game on Sunday uh, with JPP and Vernon really uh, really took over that game. With I don't care what the, the sacks total says in that game because uh, they were drawing holding penalties. Uh, they were creating pressures. Other guys were getting sacks because of their pressures. So uh, I think that those two guys have had, you know, had a first half that didn't kind of live up to what you expected, obviously, in terms of sack totals. And at, some, at the end of the day, you do need them to get some. But I think you've also seen uh, certainly glimpses of you know, what they can do. Um, so I think you just want to see them kind of continue to, to dominate games. Because that was really the first time they really kind of took over a game for, for long stretches. So uh, if they can keep that up, I think that will go a long way for this defense. James, for you, who has to step up here if, if the 2016 Giants are going to give us some uh, meaningful football to talk about in December? All right, for offense, I'm going to go kind of off the beaten track. I'm going to say Will Ty has to step up. Because getting back to what I said, I think the fact that the tight ends are blocking so poorly and they don't have a fullback is a major issue with why the run game has been so poor. And Jarrell Adams, I think he's got tremendous promise, but he's a rookie. He's raw. I think the Giants are going to use him more in the second half, but you can't push too hard with him. And I think Larry Donnell, who I've defended several times because I really think he does bring an element to the passing game that none of the other tight ends can. And he is a dynamic playmaker, but I think the ship has sailed on him becoming a efficient blocker at this point. But I think Ty is a guy who they've always said they thought has the ability to block. I think he's a guy who has – I think he should fit into the Giants' plans in the future going forward. I think he's proven that he can be a reliable player in the passing game. I think he's the guy who really has to step up and become a better, more sound blocker and try to help this running game out because they desperately need a blocking presence at tight end. And I think all things considered, Ty is the best option to get it. On the defensive side of the ball, it's tough because, as Dan said, the secondary is playing extremely well. I think the linebackers are playing pretty well. Um, the defensive ends, I mean, you could say, I think the guys who need to step up, and I'm going to go off the beaten track again, Romeo Aquara, Kerry Wynn, Oa Odugizua. The Giants have to get more pass rush depth. I think JPP and OV, they had really strong games on Sunday against the Rams. They've had solid first halves, but they've also been playing banged up for much of the first half of the season because they're on the field basically every snap. The Giants, have they, they've acknowledged that's an issue. Now they have to start moving towards fixing that issue. And I think Oa and, and Aquara and Kerry Wynn and using Devon Kennard more as a pass rusher, which they started to do on Sunday against the Rams and nickel packages, those guys have got to give the Giants more so they can take JPP and OV out so they can spell that. And so they have mo- multiple options that Spags can use on third down to try to pressure quarterbacks. Yeah, that would help. So the Giants could get more pressure in the quarterback, which they've gotten some, but probably not enough for some fans. All right, we'll wrap with this, guys. We look forward. Uh, we're doing this podcast on the Wednesday of the bye week, and the Eagles game is coming up the next time the Giants hit the field. Now, there will be a big NFC East battle between now and then between Philadelphia and Dallas, which could alter some perception. But right now, as we sit here, before the Giants take the field for the next time, thoughts on the NFC East at the bye? You know, we did this in the beginning of the season. We did it a few weeks in. It always seems to change. But the one thing that is, is uh, uh, you know, you can't argue, it's a fact, all four teams above 500 right now, only division in the NFL that has that. Dan, how do you, how do you see this division right now uh, 
seven weeks, eight weeks into the season? Uh, I mean, for, for starters, much better than I expected. I know that coming in, I thought this would be a year where nine and seven, you know, would kind of win the NFC East. It certainly doesn't look like that's going to be the case. And uh, also too close to call. I mean, I'm really intrigued to see, uh, you know, the Sunday night game between Philly and Dallas. And then obviously uh, the Giants get their shot at the Eagles next week. So uh, it's kind of a cop-out answer, but I think a lot of things obviously are still to be determined because, uh, you know, these teams haven't all played each other yet. And you're going to obviously have rematches with, you know, that Cowboys Giants game will be really interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I, every team is pretty much better than I expected. I mean, I kind of, this is kind of where I picture the Giants being, uh, but obviously I don't think anyone saw the Cowboys being where they are, uh, especially once Romo went down and then even Philly. I mean, obviously they got that, you know, that hot start, but then when they lose two games, you start to think, you know, the, the blooms kind of off the rose there a little bit with Wentz and, and then they go out and beat the Vikings. So, uh, they look like, you know, they're for real. So, uh, it's really interesting. I think it's it's great uh, for fans and just you know for the division to to have four teams playing quality football. And I think uh, you know it's going to make for a really interesting second half of the season. It is, James. How do you see this division right now? I think Sunday's game is huge because you know one the winner of that game is going to be the the favorite. I would think at this point to win the division. And two, you know, no matter what happens, win or lose with Dallas, I think it's going to have a major ramification. If the Cowboys win and beat the Eagles. Can they really go away from Dak? And what do you guys think? No, absolutely not. I don't not. think they can, yeah. Okay. yeah right, as, if, someone, as someone who was in New England at the time when uh, Tom Brady came in, I think you don't mess with uh, a young quarterback who comes in and, uh, and leads the team the way Dak has. And at the same time, if they lose to the Eagles, and they lose you know, maybe lopsidedly, which the Eagles have proven they can do, I feel like that's going to be all the impetus that the Cowboys need to just ram it through and put Romo back in. And that could totally change the dynamic of their team. So I think no matter what happens on Sunday night, that game is going to have major ramifications on the end. It's going to, one, it's going to identify the favorite, quote-unquote, in the division at this point in the year. And two, it's going to have major ramifications on how the Cowboys move forward. I'm also really intrigued to see what the Redskins do Sunday morning in London against the Bengals. This is a tough of a... Look, this is the Redskins' next six games. Bengals in London, home for the Vikings, home for the Packers, at the Cowboys on Thanksgiving, at the Cardinals, at the Eagles. Then they have the Panthers and the Bears, and they wrap it up with the Giants. The Redskins might pick to win the division going into the season. I still think they have a. I still think they can win the division, but they've got a really tough six games. You know, when we talked about the Giants, kind of the schedule's favorable for them going forward. The Redskins are about to enter a really tough stretch. Are they going to get out of that stretch still in the hunt? So for me, watch that game very closely Sunday morning and Sunday night because I think those are the games that are really going to kind of determine where these two teams go, three teams go forward. And then the Giants, I, I think the Giants just have to keep winning games. I think I wrote last week after they beat the Ravens, they've got to go 5-1 and one probably to keep pace and have a shot at the NFC East. But I think as the weeks grow and this division – is you know staying solid and balanced for the most part. I think the wild card becomes more of a realistic goal for the Giants. I mean, I think it's way too early to talk about the wild card, but I going into this year, I didn't think there's any chance the NFC East would have two teams in the playoffs. Now I think it's definitely possible. But the Giants just have to keep winning and winning the games they're expected to win, and then eventually they're going to arrive to that big showdown with the Cowboys. It should be fun. We have a lot to talk about in the second half, guys. Enjoy the bye week. I'm sure. Uh, There will be uh, a lot of twists and turns left in this season. We'll catch up again after the Eagles game and and kind of rehash what this Giants team is. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And thanks, James. You got it, Joe. And thanks to all of you for listening to Episode 71 of Talk is Cheap. Subscribe on iTunes, leave us a rating, and, of course, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can listen to Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast from NJ.com.